We are passing through all this not because that we are concerned with the history of ideas or philosophy or whatever, okay? Uh, actually, this is not a concern for us. We are talking all this, discussing all this simply because simply because we need several perspectives when we are dealing with our data, okay? So don't forget, we are working in a branch with empirical concerns, okay? Uh, and we are discussing all this to get a certain help, perhaps, uh, hopefully, in our approach to our data. Uh, uh, data coming from the social, so to speak, okay? Uh, but uh, as I told you in the beginning of the course, we didn't know even what the social is. We didn't know how we are going to conceive the social and its derivative, the society. And uh, of course, the data coming from it. Okay. You may think that data is over there, society is over here. I am here as a sociologist, delving into it and studying, etc., etc. But all these discussions may give you a hint that this is unfortunately not the case. Yeah, and if that was the case, I would be very happy, believe me. Okay? I wouldn't concern myself with all those confused ideas and so on, complicated ideas. Okay? I wouldn't care about them. But the problem is that it's not there. Okay? We are trying to make something of it, actually. So, at first we are talked about, we have talked about the separation of the body and soul. This unfortunate separation, perhaps, okay? Uh, but uh, we have seen that without that separation, it would not be possible to talk about the knowledge of whatever, okay? Uh, <coughs> and then, of course, within such separation, we gave the emphasis on the knowing part, or the part claiming to know, the soul, the mind, consciousness, okay? And later on, suddenly, Nietzsche came along and reminded us that actually the knowing of oh, somebody's phone. Shall I answer it? <laughs> Don't worry, it happens. This is a technological age. <laughs> what I was saying. Hi, Nietzsche. Okay, Nietzsche uh, coming along and telling us uh, about a different kind of knowledge, criticizing the sizes as the product of a reactive consciousness, uh, hinting for a possibility of body knowledge, perhaps, okay? But body knowledge, uh, you know, uh, body knowledge may be good for the master, perhaps, but since we are not the master, but rather, on the contrary, as a characteristic of our age, as Nietzsche described the modern age, the age of uh, nihilism, okay? We are, we are on the reactive side, unfortunately, and necessarily, therefore, depend upon consciousness. And we return back to a discussion of consciousness, but this time, uh, a discussion which problematized consciousness, right? With Freudian psychoanalytic discussions, we have found out that consciousness was something far from being integrated, unfortunately, okay? And full of dark holes in it, okay? Uh, this brought us the problem of, brought before us the problem of the unconscious, okay? And uh, the strange thing about the unconscious was that even Freud himself as even Freud himself had confessed, okay, was that neither psychoanalyst nor anybody else 
could claim to know what unconscious is. Okay. Freud was saying that the psychoanalyst can infer the existence of unconscious. Actually, there is something paradoxical here in this phrase. Okay, could infer the existence of the unconscious out of the symptoms appearing in the consciousness. Okay. Now, uh, existence of the unconscious. Now, inferring, inferring is a strange phenomenon, by the way, out of the symptoms. Now, the problem in relation to these symptoms is that these symptoms are not the symptoms of the unconscious. Okay? These symptoms are the symptoms of and in the consciousness. Okay? So, this inference uh, turns out to be a rather difficult phenomenon simply because you are dealing with something which is conscious by the consciousness itself. Okay, but that which shows itself as problematic in the supposedly smooth operating structure of the consciousness, okay, you take them as the symptoms of something which is not there, okay, and which can never be there. Okay, this poses a serious ontological problems uh, upon which I'm going to not much dwell on. But uh, now here, with the phenomenology developed by Edmund Husserl, we enter into a different phase and different interpretation or understanding or conceptualization of what consciousness is. Okay. Actually, Husserl's movement, phenomenological movement, in that regard, represents a return back, if you like, a fall back to the earlier principles, to the earliest even, uh, the Cartesian principles. Okay. Going back to the Cartesian principles. Uh, simply because the possible outcomes of these discussions developed by uh, Marx, Nietzsche and Freud okay, seem to be uh, too much dangerous for any possibility of a meaningful science. Okay. Meaningful science which is willing to raise the claim to truth. Okay. And after all, don't forget, if there is no such claim to truth, okay, what are we doing here as scientists? Okay. What the sciences are doing, what, the pro what they are producing anyway, if they are not producing the knowledge of the truth of things, of the world. Okay. We will see that, unfortunately, later on in our course. This claim to truth is not an easy claim to fulfill. Okay? But here in the Husserlian example, we have another attempt, another attempt to bring back the knowledge of the spirit and of the world onto a solid ground, onto an unshakable ground. Okay? We have seen that that solid ground has already been presented to us by the Cartesian formula, I think therefore I am. Okay. <coughs> we are going to see many discussions of this phrase later on. Okay. But one thing remains unshaken. Okay. Uh, as Descartes himself was very well aware that regardless of whatever, whatever the content, whatever the status of the thinking, etc., etc., regardless of whatever, there remains something thinking. Okay. Or let's omit the, that something, there remains thinking. With which 
Descartes, and we usually, as we usually do, okay, identifies himself. I, okay. But you know, uh, there are different approaches to the problem, as we will see with Husserl. Husserl as well uh, passes through the path paved by Kant himself, okay? But however, uh, being under the influence of an early psychologist, actually, am I right to call him a psychologist? Um, uh, simply because what he was talking about psychology, uh, empirical psychology that was, okay? was not the psychology proper as we understand the term today. Okay? By empirical psychology, I'm talking uh, the figure Franz Brentano. aiming at laying down the principles of what he called empirical psychology. Actually, if you take a look at his book, you'll find out that what he was aiming at by the term empirical was trying to free the discussions of the soul from the question of the immortality of the soul. Okay? You know, talking about the soul is not an easy matter, especially when the religious framework is predominant. So, uh, when the religious framework is predominant, the primary issue about soul turns out to be its immortality. Okay? Whether the soul is immortal or not, so that uh, out of this immortality, you can infer the existence of infinity, the truth of infinity, and therefore you can uh, develop your arguments with regard to the existence of God, etc., etc. Okay, so this was rather a theological topic, actually, whose discussion began with Plato. But Brentano, to be able to save psychology from these discussions and to be able to set the study of psychology as an investigation of the mental states, okay, put that question aside simply. Okay. So he said that yeah, I'm not going to deal with that question simply because dealing with that question will take us to another direction. I rather start with the acceptable fact that we do have or soul does have certain mental states. Okay, so I'm going to investigate, uh, search for the knowledge of these mental states. Okay, and to be able to do so, uh, he made certain assumptions. Of course, for instance, up until now, as you know, a certain assumption, especially in contradistinction to the assumptions. Uh, prevailing in the approach we have handled uh, so far. Okay, up until now we have seen consciousness or soul, if you like, as if it was some certain thing. Okay, you know we were talking about the structure of consciousness as if it was a some certain entity in contradistinction to the body. Body was an, an entity and consciousness was another entity, okay? Or consciousness of an individual was another entity and so on. Okay? However, <coughs> uh, <coughs> even though the direction Brentano took had been all the way implicit in the discussion starting with Descartes, okay? You know, we were talking about uh, thinking on the first place. Thinking with gerund, okay, with an ing at the end. Which means what we are talking about here was nothing else than an activity. Actually, uh, one of the predecessors of Kant uh, and the others as well, starting with him, was quite aware of this fact, okay, for instance, Fichte, okay. Fichte was pointing this character of activity of consciousness. Okay? So Brentano actually 
was not doing something new, was under new coloring. Okay, so consciousness, according to him, is not a thing, but is an act, an activity. Okay. What kind of act was this, however? Okay. According to Brentano, it was the act of intentionality. I can imagine that that last term, the act is easy to understand, but that last term is somehow difficult to perhaps grasp for you. What is intentionality? Is there anybody who has any idea about it? Like acting with intention, with knowing what you're doing, with, for, with a purpose. Mm, not a, in this context, not exactly. Not an act of intention, but an act of intentionality. Okay, not exactly. You are right. The meaning of the term intention implies the existence of a motive behind the action, okay? But here, it implies rather directionality, directionality of attention, if you like, okay? Giving a direction to the attention, okay? Consciousness was thinking, okay? And in Freudian case, we have talked about even in his topographic model, for instance, that even though some of the drives and motives which were awaiting uh, in the room are uh, reserved for these unconscious, okay, uh, succeed in penetrating into the room where consciousness dwells, okay, uh, they should drive the attention of the consciousness onto themselves to be able to be conscious drives and motives. Okay, so it is in that sense, okay, consciousness, if you like, in the act of intentionality, directs its attention onto something, okay, or some uh, place. Okay, so this was the basic ideas which were most influential, I guess, on Husserl's early development, okay. And actually, out of this, he developed uh, what have been called the phenomenological approach. Okay, I'm going to read certain passages actually uh, later on, not now, if I can find them, of course, as usual, uh, from the reading material. Another important point uh, in Brentano's thinking was the limitation brought about by Kant. You know, that limitation, that unhappy limitation. You know, <laughs> we cannot reach out, or consciousness cannot reach out the things in themselves as they are in themselves, but rather can only deal with the phenomena. So after uh, making such assumptions, how do you expect that somebody would be able to succeed in establishing knowledge on solid ground, sciences on solid ground, okay? Again, the solid ground we are talking here um, is nothing else than something of the universality of the Kantian thinking. You know, Kantian thinking suggested that the universality of human knowledge is grounded on the universality of the structure of the consciousness. Okay? This practically means that the world could be whatever it may be, but we as humans, since we all do share the same characteristics of a consciousness, okay, we come to know this world, we come to understand this world in similar ways. Okay? If not exactly in the same way, in similar ways at least. Okay? So that human knowledge therefore can claim a kind of universality which is limited to the condition of being human. 
However, okay. Now again, the same or similar principle applies here, simply because we have left the possibility of the knowledge of the nomena thing in itself. Okay. We will see that in the phenomenological discussion, though, the term thing in itself will acquire a new, different meaning than it was meant in the Kantian framework. Okay. <coughs> but before that, perhaps, uh, before entering into a discussion of the phenomenological understanding of consciousness, uh, before perhaps we have to see the steps taken by Husserl to be able to arrive at a phenomenological approach. Actually, in that regard, Husserl prefers to return back to the earlier ancient Greek philosophy, okay, where he finds out that problematizing knowledge, or if you like, in more practical terms, setting the problem of knowing things requires a certain withdrawal or distancing. You know, in earlier courses, in earlier lectures, we have talked about this distancing, okay? okay? To contempt, to be able to contemplate the world, in other words, according to Sal, adapting the that methodological step of the ancients, okay, one has to withdraw from that world. Okay. This approach actually uh, is summarized in the ancient Greek term thaumazine. The theoretical attitude, okay. Actually, it means wonder, okay? <coughs> wonder about the world, wonder about the experience. To wonder, okay? So that it's only possible to wonder about the world when you withdraw from the world and take the world before you as something to be contemplated, okay? Otherwise, as we have told, okay, if you do not pause the question of knowing the world for yourselves, okay? I said this earlier in one of the earlier lectures as well, okay? I think that despite contrary to what Aristotle says, for instance, he says that in his Metaphysics early page, all men do naturally desire knowledge, he says. Okay. I think I do not share, agree with him. I do not share this viewpoint. Okay. Uh, I think that it's not necessary for all men to exist in the world in a knowing mode, so to speak. Okay. Or it's not necessary for every man all the time to exist in the world in a knowing mode. Actually, most of the times, okay, we do not concern, we do not approach the world in a knowing mode. We are not trying to know things most of the time, if you like, okay, perhaps. Or perhaps most of the people can live without trying to know the world as well, okay. No problem with it, if you ask me. Okay, okay, this uh, uh, topic of discussion, I'm not going to dwell on it. What I try to mean is this, okay. <coughs> if all the men do naturally desire to know, this means that all men, to be able to know, somehow, a certain degree, some at, up to a certain degree, should withdraw from the world. Okay? In other words, actually, this is nothing else than another application, another incarnation of that original split. Okay? between the knowing something and the known something, okay? You know, this original split showed itself as the separation of internality and externality, and later on as the separation of soul and body, okay? So the soul being the knowing part and body being the known part, okay? 
So to be able to know the body then, or to be able to know the externality, the term already says it. That which is, that which knows, has already withdrawn from the world, separating itself as some certain specific internality. Okay? In contradistinction to the externality of the world to be known. Okay? Actually, what Husserl reminds, so to speak, is nothing else than this. Okay? That withdrawal, that wonder. <coughs> in front of the world, okay, is necessary for the philosophical attitude, according to him. However, this implies certain new points within the framework of Husserlian thinking, okay. This withdrawal means, <coughs> according to him, ceasing, stopping the engagement with the world, okay. You are not going to engage with the world, but rather by withdrawing from the world, you set yourself in a position to be able to watch, to be able to ponder about, to be able to wonder about the world. Okay? So, what do we have is, is that due to this attitude of Thauma Zain, okay, The knowing withdraws from the world. What does it mean, practically speaking, in the phenomenological sense? Okay, it means actually what he would call as assuming an attitude of epoche. You know, epoche, um, suspension. Refraining from judgment about the world. Okay? When we cease our engagements with the world, okay, we are actually practically refraining, making any judgments, generating any judgments about the world. In other words, only through such an attitude, the world may show itself as it is for us. But don't forget, the last phrase is quite tricky, last two terms. The world shows itself as it is. This as it is may imply, or you may interpret this, this as it is uh, in the sense of an older meaning of the uh, in itself. But here, the addition of for us makes it rather tricky. Simply because now red, as it is for us, points to a different meaning, actually, for the term as it is. Okay? Actually, when Husserl would uh, raise the flag or slogan, return back to the things themselves, for instance. Okay? It was not in the sense of the term of things in themselves as it has been suggested in the Kantian discussions. Okay. Now things in themselves will acquire a new meaning with the addition of for us. Okay. Things in themselves, so to speak, for us. It may seem rather contradictory, but the contradiction is about to be solved by this attitude of epoche, suspension. <laughs> we said that suspension is about suspending, or epoche is about suspending judgments. About the world.
In other terms, it practically means that you do not develop judgments about the whatness of the world, whether the world exists or not, or whatever, okay? Whether the world exists in this or that mode or whatever, okay? You do not make any such judgments. This implies a certain withdrawal or, if you like, a disengagement. This is the meaning of the disengagement or, if you like, the practical result of disengagement from the world, okay? When you disengage from the world and at assume the attitude of Epoche or Thalmazain, okay? The world stands there, you no? Know, but you're without making any judgments. Now, actually, this point uh, uh, refers back to the Cartesian idea of doubt, okay? You know, you remember. Uh, this was one of the most important steps in Cartesian methodology. Okay. Uh, Descartes, before starting to develop his argumentation, you know, took everything he claimed to know up until that time into doubt. Okay. Uh, however, by this way, he thought that he succeeded in achieving an empty state of the mind, okay, an empty mind. Therefore, out of this emptiness was he able to formulate such a statement, okay, I think, therefore I am, okay. And its isolated character, as you know, this statement rejects to establish any connection with something which is outside of the eye, okay, everything here inside the eye and the eye confirms to itself its own existence on an unshakable ground. Okay? So that, however, within the context of the Husserlian phenomenology, the attitude of epoche does not mean such a radical doubt annihilating everything in the actual experience. Okay? But suspending judgment means that the experience is taken as what it is, about which there would be no judgments. That's all. Okay. So, a poet does not cancel out the experience, if you like, the contents of consciousness. In Descartes, the contents of the mind has been emptied out. Okay. Here, in the Husserlian epoche, what we have is not an empty mind. We do have still the contents of the thinking, if you like. We do still have the contents of the consciousness as acts of intentionality, okay? But we are refraining from making judgments. We are not making any judgments about these contents. That's the crucial difference. Another important point with regard to the uh, understanding of a consciousness as the act of intentionality is this. Actually, it was there in Descartes in the very formula of thinking. Okay? It was already there from the beginning. But, uh, you know, this uh, brings with uh, an important set of follow-up ideas, so to speak. First of all, if Consciousness is an act of thinking or act of intentionality. What happens to consciousness when it does not engage in that act of intentionality? Hmm? Do you think? We have said that in Brentano's approach, consciousness should not be understood as if it is something, okay? But rather it should be understood as an activity, an act of intentionality. And the simple question is this, what do you think, what happens to consciousness when there is no such acts of intentionality? Hmm? It wouldn't exist. Yeah, exactly. There wouldn't be any consciousness. But just like we have faced the problem in the, uh, in the existence, problematic existence of the unconscious, 
What do you think, uh, what the consciousness would think about itself, when, about the cases, about the times when it does not commit in the act of intentionality? That's an interesting problem. Say, consciousness now, at time one, engage in acts of intentionality. Which makes it a consciousness. Okay? And at time two, for instance, <coughs> no act of intentionality. And at time three, again, acts of intentionality. What about this? What about that T2 time? Would be able to say that there was a consciousness there? We will not be able to, according to the definition, to do so. Okay. But what about the T3 consciousness? Trying to think about T2 conscious, non-consciousness. Would it be aware of the existence of such a moment? What do you think? It wouldn't be aware of. So it would necessarily tend to think itself as something complete and continuous throughout whole of the time of its existence. Okay. Again, this means that even though we may think about consciousness as an act, an act of intentionality, okay, this doesn't cancel out the claim of consciousness to <coughs> unity and completeness, both in space and time. Okay. Simply because the acts of intentionality are all will be connected with each other and presenting themselves to the intentionality itself in the form of a coherent whole. Okay. And out of this coherent whole, Husserl would be able to work out uh, the features of the, let me call it this way, even though Husserl did not call it so, the features of the structure of the acts of intentionality. Okay. The universal features of the structure of the acts of intentionality, so to speak. Okay. But before that, <coughs> I'm, I'd like to read certain quotations. Uh, Husserl makes a distinction about this distinction, the quotations would be. Okay. Husserl makes a distinction between the phenomenological attitude, okay, assuming the epoche on the one hand, and the natural attitude with engage, which engages in the world. Okay. Okay, let me read. Uh, the root of the crisis, Husserl wrote a book, uh, actually published uh, 1936 or so, as far as I remember, entitled The Crisis of the European Sciences, uh, in which he discussed uh, the problems of the uh, modern sciences. Okay. So the root of the crisis, the crisis of the European man and his sciences, okay, who self thought, lay in the fact that the ideal of rationality, the ideal of disinterested theory, had gradually became identified with a set of assumptions which is called naturalism. Okay. Naturalism is the belief that the extraordinary success of natural knowledge are now to be extended to knowledge of the spirit. Now, this is a good old problem. Okay. I do not know you, but when I first started uh, this department as a freshman, okay, 
it was in one of the major topics in our uh, course introduction to sociology okay and the methodology of the uh, social sciences or natural sciences what kind of methodology should social sciences adapt should it should they develop themselves a new peculiar methodology uh, as it can be exemplified in the so-called interpretative method or sociology or uh, should should it try to adapt the methodology of the natural sciences and methodology of the natural sciences primarily concerns as you know what quantification you know quantification of the social phenomena okay. as we have seen there is nothing problematic with it uh, in Nietzsche's discussions so what matters is not quantification but how do you quantify okay okay let me continue naturalism is the belief that uh, okay I've, I've read this okay so that this enormous success of the natural sciences according to Husserl okay enforced or brought about a certain enforcement on the social sciences as to adapt their methodology okay <coughs> but however according to Husserl such an extension of the methodology of the natural sciences is an aberration onto the sciences of the spirit you know in German it's called Geisteswissenschaften what we call social sciences translates as Geisteswissenschaften literally meaning sciences of the spirit you know Geist over there It implies practically human sciences, but yeah, and it, even though these terms translated into each other from English to German, human sciences, social sciences, Geisteswissenschaften, actually neither their origin nor their scope being the same. Okay, so one should be careful in translating these terms. It is an aberration, adaption of the methodology of the natural sciences for Husserl, simply because the least amount of attention given to these psychic processes, as they actually occur in experience. Okay, uh, he, he means by this uh, instance of willing, thinking, imagining, and the like. Okay, which are utterly different in nature from the material objects studied in physics, according to him. To extend the methods of natural science to the psychic life is to objectivize, according to him, this life. Okay? It is to treat psychic process as if they were material objects existing in the same public space and time as the bodies with which these processes are associated. Okay, before going any further, let me ask you, what do you think about this? You know, you are will be sociologists, so you gotta have a certain attitude if you not opinion or a well developed argument. Okay, what do you think about this? Yeah, and adapting the methods of the natural sciences, would it cause us to lose the possible knowledge of the spirit and objectivize the spirit? You know, why spirit or we may mean well the Hegelian spirit, but as well more mundane things like our acts of thinking, uh, decision making, if you like, or any other willing, desiring, so on and so forth. What do you think? What kind of object or possible objects sociology should take for itself? And in what way? What's your opinion? Your choice. Yeah, an adoption of the methodology of the natural sciences, what do you say? Do you think will it cause a defect in the knowledge of the social? What are we studying in social? 
Okay, forget about theoretical matters. Okay, we are going to talk about now in this couple of minutes before the break about quite practical concerns. Humans. humans. Sociology, studying humans. I thought biology studies humans. I thought psychology studies humans. But I didn't think that sociology studies humans. For me, sociology studies something completely different from the human. The human society is not human, you know. It's something else. The human social relations is not human. It's something else. Yeah, okay, interaction between. Okay, I can accept as well. It's studying human from a social, sociological point of view. What does it mean? What else? Do, do you have anything to add? Okay, what else? Practical, practical, not general. I'm practical. For instance, what are your concerns in your studying sociology? What kind of knowledge? you are after here. You know, everybody develops a certain interest. You know, some, uh, I don't know, sociology of family. I don't want to know how the Turkish family, for instance, undergoes certain transformations, perhaps. Why not? Okay. Or I want to know what uh, the effects of domestic labor in society. Or I want to know the relationship between mm, a level of education and, uh, and high school preferences, level of education of the families, parents, and children's high school preferences, for instance. Why not? Or I want to know the connection between level of income and what? Divorce. For instance, why not? Okay, what kind of concerns do we have here? Practical, not theoretical. Divorce, by the way. Hmm. Yeah, everybody may have a concern. We are third grade students, you know? So that you should begin to develop certain interests. You should begin to develop certain accumulated knowledge about the discipline sociology and therefore out of this accumulated background you about to or have already developed certain interests in the field. You know, when I say sociology, when I say social, it implies a, almost everything under the sun. Okay? So that, you know, one thing when you start to write a piece of paper or a uh, thesis or PhD dissertation, your advisor, your supervisor would tell you is to delimit, restrict, shrink down your topic. You know? So what's your, what are your concerns? And what do you think about this premise of the adoption or non-adoption of the methodology of the natural sciences in studying social phenomena. Come on, man, don't, don't be shy. Everybody may develop some stupid interest, you know. So there is no harm in it. You are smiling, you may have an interest, which may be I'm, to, I'm talking to you, the owner of the phone, <laughs> which may, may sound stupid, you suspect. <laughs> okay, don't you have, really? Don't you have the interest or don't you have the courage to stay? For instance, what kinds of papers or on what kinds of topics are you going to write your term papers in this semester? 
You know, this is not up to your choice always entirely. Sometimes enforced by as the requirements of the course. But well, all right, you are going to write papers, term papers this semester. Okay, you are, so you are about to do so. So what kind of? Some of your instructors perhaps have already asked you to deliver some proposals about the term papers. Okay, so what was there in your proposal? Just silence, you know. With silences, you cannot get a passing grade here in this university. <laughs> you have to either talk or write them, okay? Okay, finally, thank you very much. <laughs> Relationship between surveillance society, thank you very much by the way. Relationship between surveillance society and what you said? Modern. And modernity. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and what do you think about this proposition of the, with regard to the application of the methodology of natural sciences? on this study, for instance. Uh -huh. yeah, and do you think it would be appropriate, or do you think it would cause certain <laughs> defect or deformation in the knowledge you hope to acquire from your study? So you are saying that you are going to trace the transformation of the modern society into surveillance society out of the literature. And you, what do you think about the literature? Have you covered any literature on this already? So you have observed how the literature operates in that field. And what do you think about that literature? Do you think that that literature adapts the methodology of the natural sciences? Yes. Okay. In what sense? Uh -huh. And this concept is related with social science methodology. For example, uh, when we think about the uh, ID cards, for example, uh, it's a, uh, I think it's strong, but it's a fact in okay. our social life. Uh, and we can observe it uh, in our methodology also. And we can criticize it in terms of, for example, Marxist term. And uh, in what I've observed in Leon, David Leon's articles is uh, the method Mm -hmm. uh, but the critical point is that modernity is the vital for not uh, surveillance is not vital for modernity and criticizing is based on all this term. Mm -hmm. You know, um yeah and, uh, I didn't get uh, whether the literature uses in that field uh, or adapts the methodology of natural sciences, you know, methodology of the natural sciences, as it has been exemplified by the Newtonian study of the philosophy of nature from mathematical true or mathematical principles, or uh, it's shortly called Principia, where Newton uh, actually develops the method of calculation of the movement of the planets in the solar system. Okay, so this was accepted as the cornerstone of the exemplary work of the modern science. And in, in it, uh, what we have found is the somehow amalgamation, but I do not like the term, okay, bringing together, bringing together uh, rationality with empirical observation, you know. 
So actually, uh, rationality here in, in, in our methods shows itself in the form of the development of the hypothesis. You know. <laughs> so first rational step is to develop a hypothesis, you know. And then second step is observation through measurement. I say observation through measurement simply because this is not any observation, you know, this is not any observation, but through measurement, which means that observation in quantitative terms, okay, <laughs> and return back to the uh, hypothesis and improve it. Again, observation, and again, modification of the original hypothesis, and so on. Okay, by this way, uh, this is su the suggested supposed methodology of the natural sciences. By this way, it has been claimed that human knowledge, each and every step, approaches more and more to the truth of the things. Okay. Well, Husserl was saying here that if you adapt this methodology, whether it is quantifying techniques, so on and so forth, measurement, the basis of measurement, sorry, observation as measurement, okay, he claims that we are going to miss a good deal in the knowledge or possible knowledge of the spirit. I do not know, but whatever you understand by the term spirit, okay, you know. Uh, if you like, human sciences, okay. or knowledge about the human. Okay. So what do you say? For instance, the term surveillance itself. Now my question is this, yes, there are ID cards for everybody. Yes, there are cameras almost catching our every movement in public places or even in private places. Okay. Yes, there are organized networks or systems to collate this data okay, to be able to produce something meaningful about us, about each and every person of us. Yes, there are this and those. These are the facts, okay, which you can go and observe and measure. But the question is, do they readily give the notion of surveillance? It may well give the notion of a well-organized society, perhaps. Why surveillance? For instance, all those European societies that you are so much fond of are quite very well organized due to the well-established procedures of surveillance. Then the question, why do you call it surveillance rather than a well-organized society? We can say something, uh, otherwise we are not going to take a break. <laughs> huh? I'm not going to let you before you making you say something. Is a method of organization surveillance? Yeah, of course, method of rationalization, increasing rationalization. The more I collect data about society, after all, that's what we are for, right? We sociologists. Okay, 
to collect information, knowledge about the society. Okay, the more I know about the society, the more I can organize the society better. Well, okay. The more I know about you, the more I can organize your life. Hmm? The more I know about your problems, the more I can bring solutions to your problems. Say health problems, practical. Say educational problems, problems. shortage of schools, shortage of teachers, instructors, shortage of hospitals, doctors, you know. Without watching you, okay, without collecting data about you, I wouldn't be able to know. For instance, the capacity of the public roads. Okay? If I do not know about the intensity of the traffic in a specific place, okay, I wouldn't be able to bring with solutions. Okay? So why do you call it the surveillance society? What so to my ears, I don't know your ears, but to my ears. It sounds something negative, okay, with negative connotations. And when you call a society a surveillance society, it shows me that you assume a somewhat critical attitude about that society and about those procedures that make that society, that make you call that society surveillance society. Okay? So why being so negative? Try to think from the positive side. A well-controlled society is a happy society where the problems can easily be solved. Hmm? Why not? You should define the problem then. Uh, you say you want to solve a problem. You define a problem first. Yeah. Then comes surveillance. No, it's the, the people themselves complain about the problems. And by establishing a surveillance society, I would be able to aware about those complaints in the first place. You know? For instance, they complain about the shortage of the doctors. Okay? Don't you complain about it. We ourselves. Not nobody else, okay? Anybody else. We ourselves, okay? The shortage of the doctors in the society, okay? I wish that for every at least 100 person in Turkish society, there gotta be an able physician, doctor. Okay? I wish that for every 20 children, there gotta be a teacher in our schools. Hmm? And to be able to achieve or answer these demands, first of all, you should be able to know about these demands, okay? And you should be able to know the capacity, your capacity to produce doctors, to produce teachers, etc., okay? And you should be able to handle the methods of producing them. And then, only then you can answer such problems, right? And isn't all these wishes are all ours at the same time? Don't we share this? Why then call it the surveillance society? What do you imply by this? There is something implicated, implied in there, secretly implied in there, which cannot be found in the empirical observation of the data, in the quantitative measurement of the data. What's this? Hidden point. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, and, uh, the character of intentionality, if you like, the character of the assumed directionality in looking at, who I would call it later on, uh, the modality, if you like, modality of intentionality, okay? We are going to come to this. Well, 
What implies this particular modality of intentionality? This negative attitude in connection with the society whose control mechanisms turn out to be highly developed. Actually, we got to be happy, I propose. <laughs> Why? Are you against my proposition? Ain't we going to be happy in a controlled or surveillance society? Surveillance society means less crime, you know, at the same time. Yeah, with an idealistic approach, it could be easily exploited. Surveillance society. It has already been exploited, but for your own good. You know, isn't it us, ourselves, that demand cameras in certain secluded sections of our university? <coughs> for instance, I know a PhD dissertation on the topic of fear. Okay? It shows surprisingly that people fear more here in the campus than they fear in the center of the city, Kızılay. Okay? And the sole reason is that there are cameras in Kızılay. Okay? So how do you explain this? It means that people prefer to have cameras around us. Okay? It is we. When I say people, it's we, nobody else. Okay? We prefer to have cameras around us. Huh. So, so why then this negative tune in this conception of surveillance society? What does it imply? Okay, let me tell you, otherwise we are not going to be able to make it out. Okay? Uh, it implies that it sets a challenge against our individuality, against our privacy. Hmm? Okay. What's our privacy? What's our individuality? Ain't all our suppositions or acceptances. Okay. If you are good enough to put away your own personality, your ego, your narcissistic ego in Freudian terms, you would be feel well happy under the ages of this surveillance. Okay? You know, there you watch on TV cars crashing, okay? filmed by the cameras. Okay? At other places, again filmed by cameras, you watch the real criminals committing crimes. Since they have been filmed, okay, they can be well easily captured, caught and punished. So aren't we really happy about the consequences? Aren't we are all convinced that the existence of camera <coughs> limits the probability of crime? Hmm? And aren't we all feel fear, at least in the face of a crime committed against our person? our property, if not other's person and other's property. So what's so precious in your individuality, in your privacy, okay, that you'd like to reserve for your own self without being watched by the, by the authority? Hmm? Isn't it just another presupposition that I have my own private person, autonomous, which should keep itself a private space where it can display all the narcissistic tendencies of its ego? Hmm? Is that our wish? You know, my bed is quite private. No camera can catch me when I was lying. Yeah, it's like the Google search history. No one would like uh, one's Google search history to be seen by others. Yeah, okay. That's exactly this. And the problem is that I guess, after all this, again, let me ask you whether it's appropriate to apply the methodology of social science. Of course, it's appropriate in certain problematizations of the social phenomenon. I'm not saying this. But when you limit yourself 
only to the uh, methods of the natural sciences. I'm going to ask that again, once again, okay, without uh, getting an answer from the class, I'm not going to continue, okay. Uh, without strictly restricting, to restricting ourselves to the methods of the natural sciences, what do you think about Husserl? Could he, he be right in claiming that, that it causes a certain aberration in the knowledge of the spirit? For instance, how am I going to be able to find this hidden negative tune in the conceptualization of the surveillance society in contrast to the conceptualization of a well-organized welfare society? Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, and this is the Weberian attitude, you know. Uh, value judgments uh, may be allowed to determine uh, our subject matter, but never allowed to interfere in our methodology, he says. Okay? But here we are talking about methodology. Okay? So, approaching the phenomena in a neutral fashion, as if the phenomena is nothing else than a quantity. Okay. And observing that phenomena, say that phenomena, when I say that phenomena, fact, okay, that everybody in Turkey, almost everybody in Turkey has ID cards, which means they have been already registered in the registers of power. Hmm? So you have already been given up to power. Okay. Why complain about the surveillance society? Okay, 